Let's be blunt with Montel. I can't tell you why I'm saying. Well, let me tell you why I'm saying. First off, he's a champion of the middle class, working families, state assemblyman. He has represented the 33rd district of uh, New Jersey, Hudson County, in New Jersey legislature. He's a former deputy mayor of Jersey City. He's a former sergeant, which was a, you know, t- t- touched my heart immediately, sergeant in the United States Marine Corps Reserve. And in the private sector, he's a lawyer, a health care investor, and was previously in, in, involved in information technology. But you got to understand who this guy is. I, I'm, gonna, I'm talking about a guy by the name of Mr. Raj Mukherjee, who's a, an assemblyman. And in the assembly, he sits right now on the budget committee responsible for crafting the state's budget around approximately $33 billion back in 2015, as well as the Commerce and Economic Development and Labor Committees. Assembly Mukherjee is, is the only Indian Bengali state legislator in the entire United States. And not only that, but this guy, this is, you know, I, I look back at my history and think I'm an overachiever. Give me a break. This dude is like overachiever personified. You know, he's, he, he, I, let me read you a little bit about him because this is going to blow you out the door. This young man, he's a son of immigrants. Assemblyman Mukherjee supported himself, supported himself through school, high school and college and grad school as an emancipated minor when economic circumstances forced his family to return to their home of India. And I'm going to go into that a little bit in a second. But Raj, when he was in high school, ready for this? In middle school, he founded an internet consulting company and software development company. And he later grew it and sold it to a really large technology company to enlist in the Marine Corps. And he enlisted in the Marine Corps two weeks after 9-11 at the age of 17, where he served in the military intelligence Guy after my heart right there, because you know, I was a special duty intelligence officer in the United States Navy. And as a young entrepreneur, he withdrew from high school after completing the ninth grade to focus on his business endeavors, and he supported himself. This is this is a guy, when I say overachiever, I, I'm barely getting started. He is, you know, a New Jersey assemblyman. He's, again, I've already said it, first Indian Bengali state legislator in the United States government. He's an attorney. He is a cannabis healthcare entrepreneur. He's a former deputy mayor of Jersey City. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Assemblyman Raj McCurdy. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here, Raj. Thank you so much for having me. What you left out is that I have a face for radio, so I'm very, very excited to, <laughs> to be on a, on a podcast. I am blushing from that overly generous introduction, but I am so excited to be here with a champion for patients and I will tell you, I know that right this second there are people Googling you right now and ladies out there going, hmm, (laughs) hmm, what's he talking about, face for radio? Hmm, (laughs) is he single? Hmm, you're single, right? I am not. No, you're not single. That's right. As a matter of fact, just had a brand new baby. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations, sir. Four, yeah, three in, uh, three months and change, four months uh, on the 23rd, Leo, and my wife Natasha and I are just uh, absolutely over the moon. It's... Are you sleeping any at all right now? I, and she's a saint on weeknights yeah. where she takes a disproportionate share, and I try mm-hmm. to make up for her on weekends. And we are sleeping more now than, uh, uh, than in the first couple of weeks. Uh, wow. <laughs> but you know, let, let's talk a little bit for a second. You not only your duties as a legislator, but you actually founded your own cannabis company, correct? That's right. Yeah, we uh, um, we had a multi-state uh, cannabis company that was sold earlier earlier this year, and mm-hmm. we've embarked on our new endeavor, a company called Cantech, which is going to look to replicate the uh, responsible employer multi-state cannabis operator model that also looks at, it gets involved in clinical research and preclinical research, someday hopefully translational research, and then investments in the ancillary space, technologies, things like that. And I think people need to understand there's, been a, there's a huge difference out there right now in providers of cannabis across the country. You know, you have recreational states, we have, you know, medical marijuana states, we have states where just, you know, they've just decriminalized a little bit. And in all those states, we have people who are out here selling products, but none of them, I think, have the approach that you've taken. What sent you down this path? Because, I mean, you could have just jumped in as an entrepreneur that you are and said, let's make some money and skip over some of the, I think, most important rules that you've implemented within your own company. Um, You know, I think uh, uh, part of it is that I got into this space by accident, Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I I surround myself with some really great people that got into it for similar reasons. Um, 
long before I was in the legislature. And it's a, it's a part-time legislature. Mm-hmm. We're at the state level, uh, many states have citizen legislatures, so you have civilian occupations. Gotcha. Mine, mine happens to be, you know, uh, cannabis, <laughs> oh, okay. uh, regulated cannabis, and and um, and healthcare investments and law. And um, back in the day, before uh, I was in elected office and before I was in public service at all. Um, I had a government affairs and consulting firm and different healthcare investments, surgery centers, things like that. And my father uh, was, he had had a pituitary tumor. Um, and in recovering from that, he was on steroids for his glands to function. But the side effect was he had a couple of strokes. He had other conditions. Mm-hmm. And it's actually his glaucoma, when he was, he was treatment resistant wow. to conventional prescriptions for the reduction of intraocular pressure. And uh, there was literature out there about medical marijuana. Correct. As a matter of fact, they even... You know, go back about 25 years, 30 years, you know, the federal government went in and produced a synthetic version of cannabis, what was called Marinol, one of the most still, expensive still but, least, but least used drugs in this country today because they realized that the synthetic version did not actually, you know, uh, achieve what they wanted, especially when it comes to having, you know, the endocannabinoid system even recognize what it was. That's truthfully. exactly right. That's exactly right. There's a, there's a lot, there are any number of cannabinoids in the, in, in the whole plant and... Uh, those derivatives are, are, are lost in some of those synthetic versions. Maybe they've had some more luck with epidiolics uh, for specific uh, subset of patients. But but anyhow, but yeah, and and um, and so he became the first patient member of a medical advisory board of one of the the six nonprofit New Jersey mm-hmm. uh, grower dispensaries. We call them ATCs in New Jersey. And um, unfortunately, he 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 died in 2013 and uh, didn't get to actually. Um, try a uh, product from wow. the dispensary or see it open, which happened later that year. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, it um, so, and then my medical director, my chief medical officer in the company, he had uh, unfortunately lost. He was physician and and um, and uh, physician administrator in, in the hospital space for MedStar, which owns Georgetown University Hospital and so forth. And mm-hmm. he lost his daughter to cancer oh. uh, in uh, just a couple of years ago, and she was only in her 30s. But she was a medical cannabis patient, and mm-hmm. it made the um, a really really horrible situation a little little less unbearable yes as we know from those of us who'd had loved ones that had alleviated the side effects of cancer and chemo Absolutely. and uh, appetite loss and nausea and, and pain with um, medical cannabis and so and and my 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 partners David and Justin Weiser had lost their mom to pancreatic cancer and so we we were uh, operating our company certainly we wanted to do well we had a duty to our shareholders. Um, but we also uh, wanted to do good, and you can do that while doing yes. well in this space. Even on the adult use side, when you're remedying the uh, social injustices of our failed drug policies sure from thing. yesteryear, and I say yesteryear, still today. And when, we, and when we say the recreational side, you know, I, I, I've said this over and over again, and people think I'm crazy, but most people who turn to cannabis don't even recognize that they have an underlying probable medical issue, the reason why they turn to it to begin with. They turn mm-hmm. away from alcohol, they turn away from all these other substances and turn to cannabis because they're getting a relief that they can't get otherwise. Whether they think they're just out there getting the buzz or not, that's really not the bottom line. Sure. They're probably... You know, there's an underlying, whether it be, you know, anxiety, whether it be sleep, whether it be, you know, just being able to cope with daily life. They're trying to achieve a medical benefit even if they think they're doing it recreationally. That's what I believe. They're getting relief, but you know what they're not getting? They're not getting violent. They're not right. They're not uh, dealing with uh, the various adverse effects of other things that are legal, other substances that are legal. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not... Uh, um, uh, a cannabis user, but I drink. That's my vice. Mm-hmm. And you know what? I've I've seen folks do a lot worse um, when they're drunk wow. than than when they're high. <laughs> well, I gotta tell you something. I am a now pretty much. You know, I'm not abstinent of alcohol, but I have. I can tell you right now, I've not had a drink or a sip of alcohol now in over five months. I barely, better man than me. I barely have that. I, I probably over the course since my diagnosis with MS, which was almost twenty years ago. I, you know, on occasion will drink two sips of champagne on New Year's Eve. Sure. Be at a dinner with somebody else. My wife will, will say, hey, you know, look, taste, taste this. And I'll take a taste of maybe a Chardonnay. But when I say a taste, it's literally wet my lips and that's about it. And it's not that I, you know, I knock those who drink. But I got to tell you, I come from a family of drinkers and come from a family, my, my wife's family are drinkers. And, you know, 
I'm not knocking you, but I got to tell you, people are a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more angry, a little bit more moody, a little bit more everything wrong, I think, when they drink. But you know what? Since it's legal, how can we deny someone who picks something that is much more, I, I, you know, I, I say socially acceptable? Peace, is peaceful. Peaceful. Mm-hmm. Correct. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean no, that. no, that's exactly right. That's right. And, and uh, so... That, that's that's what drives sort of our interest in trying to fill some of the gaps in literature. You know, we, I, I think it's important for everybody in the industry to understand how a fully developed and sound body of research will uh, ensure that our industry grows in the right way, will get us closer to federal legalization, will get us close to, uh, you know, it's going to end this, and we're starting to chip away at it, but we're still relegated to hack status in this industry, yep. and, uh, but and I it's guess time I, for that to end. People need to know, though, your company, Cantac, has literally, is I think, setting standards in every direction. I, I visited one of your dispensaries. I'm going to say 100% disclosure. I visited a dispensary down in New Jersey, and I, one of the things that you do that I know isn't done in the industry is that every employee working in that building has some form of medical background. Yeah, we, we do like to throw our dispensaries are typically managed by a licensed clinical pharmacist. They report to our chief medical officer, who's an MD. And when we train our dispensary technicians, a lot of places call them bud tenders, and when mm-hmm. we train our patient counselors, we want to make sure um, that they're actually looking at the uh, pharmaco- pharmacokinetics. They're, they're, when they're talking to their patients, when they're counseling about mm-hmm. this, federally scheduled one substance where there aren't that many, there are a lot more questions than we have answers Correct. that they're explaining to them here's what the anecdotal evidence says might work in terms of associating certain strains and products with your debilitating illness but there's so much more we don't know and you should be aware of that and you should do your own research and you should be aware about the potential adverse effects. But I gotta tell you something, I roll into states that have what they consider recreational cannabis and walk up to a bud tender who doesn't know the slightest thing from A to Z about anything yeah. other than, uh, well, you know, hey, hey, smell this. <laughs> hey, 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 smell this. It's like, you know, wait, first off, the fact that you're gonna make me stick my nose over a bottle and, and exhale Right there, that sends me out the door because I don't know who exhaled on that same bottle five minutes before I walked in there. So it, it's dry, it drives me nuts that we are, in some ways, our greatest enemy. Yeah. You know, the people who are in this industry, and yet, you know, there are examples like yours that others could be following. There are, and there are a lot of people also doing it right. Uh, I think in terms of creating the the best consumer experience, not mm-hmm. the one that you were just talking about, but uh, mm-hmm. the, 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 the best user experience and the best patient experience when it's in those medical states where it's really mm-hmm. a kind of a clinical, clinically oriented medical model, right? Um, uh, there, I think that it, uh, a lot of it goes into training and to make, and to make sure that your workforce um, believes in what they're doing and, yes. and, is, and has the consumer in mind. There, there are a lot of people doing it right. You got industry leaders like uh, Jason Vidati and Steve White, you have Beth Stavola, you have some uh, some folks, uh, and those those examples were uh, Harvest and MPX, Iantis and so forth. And, you know, a lot and, and across their facilities, they really emphasize training at the core and delivering that best consumer experience. For us, we uh, have found it easier um, to train our workforce and uh, when they're well paid and have health benefits. How can mm-hmm. you be a health care provider without offering your co- sure. coverage to your folks? So we're a fully union shop. So every state we go into, we have a collective bargaining agreement with the UFCW We because they have that Cannabis Workers Rising campaign. They were in the industry from day one. So we are, instead of fighting it, instead of you know uh, trying to campaign against it with our sure. workforce, we invite them in. And we are proud to be a fully union shop. Even our uh, CBD, hemp derived CBD uh, product line that we're about to, to launch uh, through Aria Hemp, it's uh, it's a union shop. So we're, we, we have that label on everything we do. We're proud of it. And that's incredible. I mean, I think it's something that people need to recognize when they go out and try to find a product. They need to make sure that they're looking in the right direction. So that's how you got into the business. Now that you've been in for a while, give me, give me some of your your overall perspectives of the industry so far. What do you think of this industry? We have 34 states now in the District of Columbia that have some form of medical marijuana, marijuana law, marijuana um, redefinition, I'll call it, rather than uh, uh, 
uh, yeah, I don't even know how to, some of them say that they decriminalize, but I don't know if that's really true. And then you look at what's going on in places like Texas right now where, you know, they're trying to navigate you know, federal law and state law in some weird way that basically the police departments have thrown their hands in the air and said, I can't figure out the difference between hemp and marijuana, so I'm just going to let anything below two pounds, two ounces go. You know, it's crazy. And then you go to a state right next to it and will get busted for having, you know, less than a joint in your pocket. So what is your impression overall about what's happened in the nation? Um, so first of all, Totally inconsistent, incongruous, and unfortunately, um, what state you live in determines whether um, your epilepsy can see a drop in seizures, whether you have quality of life relief if you're mm -hmm. terminally ill, if you have cancer or HIV or uh, neurodegenerative disease or whatever the case is. Um, but across every single state, totally illogical, even if you're in one of the good states where right. it's accessible for every American who lives in uh, California or Nevada or Colorado, Washington, Oregon, right, Alaska, Maine, if uh, Massachusetts, Michigan, right, Nevada. Say, right? Nevada. Mm -hmm. um, even if you're lucky enough to be in a state where the medical cannabis is widely accessible and the the government has tried to remove the barriers to access, like New Jersey has done under Governor Murphy, like right. Arizona, like uh, um, some of the other medical states with, uh, like Delaware, with, with the more liberal programs, the more progressive approach to it. One thing is in common, which sucks across the board. It's still unbelievable that banks are not following the FinCEN guidance to try to get patients access. And people are still taking their money in coffee cans and burying them out in the dirt someplace or putting them in, you know, fictitious vaults that they think no one will be able to rob. It's just it's crazy. And no one, even the financial institutions, certainly the government, no one's making money off the float on that cash. It right. is, uh, you know, it's stuffed in a mattress. It's uh, certainly far more dangerous. Sure. Um, so, and it's, I mean, the, the Edmondson case and 280E and the tax law still haunts us in no other industry. Mm -hmm. Do you have a situation where you cannot, you're state regulated and you can't deduct your expenses and your payroll and your rent and the expenses of operating a retail store dispensary? I mean, that makes it far more difficult for uh, the, the, the folks who have been, who have suffered mm -hmm. under drug policies to get into the industry because if they open, they realize they can't turn a profit even if they would be profitable because it's all go they're paying taxes on their gross. Right. The IRS is auditing these businesses. So the tax code hasn't caught up. The banking laws haven't caught up. And most importantly, most troubling to all the dispensaries out there, no matter the quality of the grow operation, the manufacturing operation they're getting their product from, they're not following GMPs. They can't. There's no standards and right. there's no research What's the mechanism of medical cannabis? What are the exact indications you're using for? What are the cannabinoid profiles that would best create the advantage over current therapies um, for your condition? Right. You know, and, and, and all of that is still guesswork. It's still internet research Correct. and uh, trial and error. And, you know, we're using street names, but the street names are referring to very different profiles Right. From state to state, from dispensary to dispensary. And knowing that, you just nailed it, state to state, because, again, in a sense, all products have to be, you know, contiguous to the state that it's sold in. That means that, you know, and no one ever asks, where would you get the seed to start? <laughs> Nobody, they, you know, all the, they, they pass a bill in Florida, okay, we're going to make medical marijuana available in Florida. But, oh, where did that seed come from? It reminds me of a little bit of history that most people don't know about, but, you know, Thomas Jefferson has been accused of, if you look at it anecdotally, of being one of the people who actually supplied almost all the original seeds used in the United States. When he was traveling in Europe and over the Far East, he would put seeds in his pocket and bring them back so that he could sell hemp here in the United States. That's what they claim. So if that's true... I was hoping you'd say Hamilton. I was more of a Hamilton yeah. fan. <laughs> Jefferson. <laughs> Jefferson supposedly did that. You know, and, you know, George Washington, all of our forefathers grew for some reason, but where did those seeds come from? Nobody ever asked that question. So now, you know, if something's grown in New Jersey, that seed came to New Jersey from somewhere. But three growth cycles, it's not the same seed that it started out as. 
and the regulators still don't want to know, right? It's a, right. it's a chicken or the egg thing, and yeah. <laughs> I, they, you know. That's insane. I, you know, but okay. So, you know, we're sitting in a situation. Where we get it from. We get it from the stork. The stork. Stork. Uh, comes uh, stork drops over. drops it off, and and actually, uh, our storks they actually don't even fly outside of the state's borders. These gotcha. are in-state storks. These storks <laughs> avoid interstate <laughs> commerce. I mean, they're very, they're highly specialized, uh, especially trained storks. That's crazy. So okay, so now we have strains that we call the same as we call somewhere else but then you know if you notice you know if you're that you say you you know you don't consume i am and people do know that i'm a consumer and i have can tell you right now depending on that let's just make up some juju juju berries from from california are not the same as juju berries in new jersey not the same as juju berries in massachusetts and not the same as them in florida i don't care Anybody can tell. I, I, if you, I, and I bet if you tested them spectrographically, you'd find that they're not. Yeah. Profile wise, they are really different. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that's one of the things that you've been trying to do, at least within the state of New Jersey, is to standardize what is delivered under a particular strain name. The best we can, wherever we, we can. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact is that consistency is still difficult to achieve in the industry. For one thing, when you're not talking about extracts and, mm-hmm. and manufactured products where you can better achieve meter doses when you're talking about, you know, the plant, the whole right. plant, Absolutely. which when you smoke it, you know, you obviously ingest it into your bloodstream more quickly and mm-hmm. and uh, it, it's 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 harder to do from, from batch to batch. And mm-hmm. um, I, I think that, uh, you know, we'd love to get to a place where the entire industry can do better with respect to standardization and uniformity. Um, but uh, as they say, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. So right now, the best you can hope for is try to be the one-eyed person. Right, right, <laughs> right. Well, well, okay, let's talk a little bit about New Jersey itself now. I mean, they, they, the Governor Murphy has promised that he was going to change legislatively the face of cannabis in, in New Jersey, but that hasn't happened. And... You know, you got it's 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 shocking to me how we have so many candidates on the Democratic side who are claiming to be in favor of legalization, but they can't explain that any further than those words. I'm in favor of something, marijuana reform. What does that mean? You know, get in get specific. They can't even they give you have a conversation about the fact that I want to put together some standard operating procedures. I want to be able to, to identify standards. They, 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 they're not, they don't have anybody on their staff that works in cannabis where, you know, when you look nationally, I think the last poll that I saw was close to 90% of Americans believe that patients should be able to have a private conversation with their doctors about efficacious medication. So if that means ni- that's Republican and Democrat, ninety percent, ninety-one percent of Americans believe red, get blue, out of the conversation. purple. That's right. So uh, it, they believe their scientists that scientists and and their doctors uh, at the bedside should be making those decisions for them, not policymakers who have no clue what they're talking about. Yeah, it's like you know I, I I I I've talked about this before, but not on my podcast. But you know, I, about five years ago, four years ago. I went through, you know, Helen back with uh, one of my, my middle daughter who uh, was diagnosed with lymphoma and went through, she went through, you know, uh, chemotherapy and went through a whole protocol that was one of the top protocols in the world. And, um, you know, after three months, walked out of hospital and the doctor said, you're cured. I think you're in great shape. And three months later, it came back with a vengeance. And when it came back with a vengeance, um, the doctor then, I sat in a room with her. My daughter happened to be at the time 25 years old. They already turned 26. And so she was still in my insurance. So that's why I sat in the room with her. And, you know, but because she was the adult in the room, I didn't have any right to participate in that conversation. So I'm listening to a doctor tell my child that I'm about to burn you from the inside out. I'm going to give you drugs that's going to burn you. I'm going to burn your esophagus. Your hair's going to fall out. Your skin's going to change colors. You are going to go through hell and back so we can do this stem cell transplant for you. And, you know, I, I piped up once or twice, and he was like, uh-uh, I kind of, you know, not for you to, to this, your opinion doesn't matter. It's her opinion. And I'm thinking to myself, he's absolutely right. 
I don't have a right to this conversation. This is a conversation between my daughter and her doctor. And for the two of them to determine what protocol she was going to go through and how she was going to beat this. He's right. I'm paying for it, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's her right to say yay or nay. Yet if that same doctor looked me in the face and said, Montal, I want to give you, you know, a prescription for medical cannabis, everybody and their mother thinks that they have a right to jump in the middle of that conversation and determine whether or not this doctor has a right to do that for me. Now, who the hell do you think really? Who do you think you are? Get out of the conversation between a doctor and a patient. That's why, you know, I've been an advocate for, you know, almost 20 years now. Long before this became the gold rush or the green rush, I was involved in trying to ensure that patients had access to efficacious medication, number one, but number two, had access to a private conversation with their doctor. Get out of the middle of this. This is, I mean, we trust doctors to be all-knowing, all, you know, omnipotent, and, you know, like the, the guy behind the curtain in Oz, then let him do his thing. That's, you claim that he's supposed to be smart enough to do anything. He's a, he's a god, so let him do it and stay out of it. So I don't get why we are still so caught up in the conversation about this possible plant-based medication. It's crazy. Yeah. It's senseless. It's uh, NIDA has this monopoly on yes. the plant that can be used for... For, for the marijuana product that can be used for research. It's only coming from one place. It's... I think that recently I just read an article, I think uh, Dr. Sue Sicily just sued NIDA because we also, I've, I've had on my show, I you know, this was, this is again, long before anybody was talking about this. I'm telling you, 15 years ago, I had one of the recipients of the original George W. Bush or George H. Bush program that was the Compassionate Prayer Care Program where he initially allowed 23 people to receive medical marijuana. And those 23 people, what people don't understand is that the United States government through the University of Mississippi for the last, I think it's 43 years now, has been dispensing marijuana once a month in a canister that they send in the mail to people. And these people have a get out of jail card that they had long before states started passing legislation. They had a card that they could carry their marijuana anywhere in America and nobody could stop them. Now, unfortunately, out of that 21, 22 people, there's only three or four of them left now because the others have passed away. But they still get every month a canister of marijuana. From that court, from that court case. Yeah, from that court case. Just and, a handful of yeah, people. And, and yeah. what's, what is so really ignorant about it is I remember uh, I had Irv Rosenfeld, I think, Irv on my show. And Irv brought his canister and I remember that we, you know, it had just been tested by a third-party lab, and they were saying that this was some of the worst swag crap grown and known to mankind. Had had mold, had pesticides in it, and literally was just basically ground up stems, sticks, and leaves. The world's crappiest weed. And that's what you want to use as the standard bearer to conduct the only federally approved clinical trials going on in the country. What Dr. Sisley's doing with respect to the whole plant, because she has the federal approvals for the post-traumatic stress disorder research, mm -hmm. which uh, certainly you as, a, as a, both a Marine and a, and a formal Naval officer uh, can appreciate that our, our brothers and sisters in uniform deserve better when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, if they're not responsive to conventional drugs for PTSD. Uh, but what she's doing is is some some pretty great stuff. Have you ever had her her on? I haven't had her on. I'm going to try my best to get her on. I want to have her here sitting across from me so I can talk to her. She's a genius and has been doing so much good for this industry. Again, long before this became the green rush. Before long it was before cool. Before anybody thought it was cool. Out there by herself, hanging almost by a rope by herself because people were attacking her. This industry didn't come in her defense. And even right now, isn't defending her as much as they should be during this lawsuit. So I'm going to make a shout out right now for Dr. Sue Sicily and say, you know, you should just just send her a tweet saying I support you. Yeah, she's the, she's doing she's doing God's work and she is a legend. Um, Absolutely. I'll connect you guys. Please do. Yeah. Now, now, let's 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 uh, you know, I'm going to run out of time on, on uh, for, for this segment. But I wanted to, to maybe just again. So we see where the industry is sitting how long do you think it's going to take before there are changes that put us on the right path? So I'm not sure which comes first, the CARES Act, the States Act. I do think that the time is right for some meaningful level of federal reform to occur. And if that means 
that, you know, with the current situation in Washington, that Ooh. we can find some, I mean, putting aside for for a moment the fact that I think our, <laughs> it's a very dark time for our democracy a, in history. But, yeah. um, but even this president uh, has signaled to, you know, Cory Gardner and Republicans in Congress that he would sign the States Act if it got to his desk because it's actually a conservative principle, the right. anti-commandeering, you know, idea of states' rights and that the federal government's not going to interfere. And it's a conservative uh, ideal that we're talking about. So if if he can get behind the States Act, if they could get it through Congress, at least we'd have step one in some of the banking and 280E and taxation and public safety issues would be mitigated. And people, you know, we have the 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 Rohrabacher, now Joyce sure. Amendment, sure. which is which helps operators in the medical cannabis space and patients. But what about consumers in social right. justice friendly, you know, adult use legal states? Right. They're still at risk of getting federally prosecuted. That's crazy. So um, if if we had that happen at the federal level, that'd be one thing. I, I'll, you know, take New Jersey, for example. I'll say, you know, you're right. They didn't get there on adult use yet in this state. But Governor Murphy has a, a very, 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 very pro-compassion governor. He did sign legislation into law. J. Cohn named after a very, very sad story, but named after the late... Uh, young, young, young boy named uh, Jay Koenig who passed away. In mm -hmm. his memory, Jay Koenig, Compassionate Use Medical Cannabis Act, dramatic reforms to New Jersey's medical marijuana program, and even by executive order, uh, as early as just a couple of weeks after he took office, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, where he signed a sweeping executive order reforming New Jersey's medical cannabis program. It has great, it greatly expanded the program. It's made it a little less bad. Prices are still too high. Right. The program is still in the process of expanding. But he, he is taking steps to get it there. And his regulators and the Department of Health here in New Jersey and the program under uh, Jeff Browns, the assistant commissioner, who's, a, a, I think, one of the most forward-thinking visionaries in the country. Uh, there's two regulators I'll call out, and it's Jeff Brown in New Jersey and Paul Highland in Delaware. These are the two most forward-thinking visionaries out of regulators wow. that look at it from the patient's perspective. How do we get the patient uh, safe, quality, affordable access as quickly as possible, right? Everything else is secondary. We will figure it out. It's about the patients. Uh, I think that they, they have made great strides in... Um, in 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 improving the medical programs in these states, but you're absolutely right. It's going to take legislation uh, to get there on adult use. Um, I just can't explain why I why it hasn't hasn't happened in every state, right. including our own. I, I I I'll 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 probably abstain because I'm in the industry, yes. you know, from the actual bill when it comes up. Uh, you know, uh, uh, but uh, but at the end of the day. Um, they haven't gotten there yet here. Gotcha. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you, I'm almost out of time. And I want to make sure that, you know, every one of my, my Let's Be Blunt with Montel podcasts, I like to make sure I leave you with a little thought, something that maybe you haven't thought about when it comes to cannabis. Most people don't recognize that it wasn't until 1937 that the Marijuana Tax Act took place that literally, for the first time, made marijuana illegal. And what most people don't understand is that the gentleman by the name of Anslinger, who was the biggest proponent to actually, and we know that he got some funding from William Randolph Hearst and from DuPont to ensure that, you know, he pushed this narrative forward. So it wouldn't thousand, compete with paper. Correct, <laughs> but, but paper and also textiles. Uh, exactly, Remember? textiles. So, yeah. because we have, but most people don't understand that before 1937, almost every rope, every tent, canvas, every sheet, the entire revolutionary army was clothed in uniforms made from hemp fiber. Uh, you know, what people don't know is that five years before when Prohibition, or 10 years before Prohibition was still in place, Anslinger was a backer of cannabis. As a matter of fact, was noted as stating himself that, you know, cannabis was less violent and actually proposed it as an alternative to alcohol. It wasn't until he lost his gig as, you know, a prohibitionist that he decided, hmm, I need something to fight, so I'll just fight cannabis, and he did so. So look it up. It'll, it'll, it'll enlighten you and give you an idea as to why we are still on this path almost 100 years later. Assemblyman 
McCurdy, thank you so much, sir, for being a part of this podcast, man. Thank you for everything you've done, your advocacy. You have, you know, the patients out there uh, uh, in, in the United States, they have, they have a lot to thank you for. Oh, thank you, sir. Join us on the next Let's Be Blunt. If you like what you hear, you know what you got to do. You got to go ahead and make sure you send me a little summary of your thoughts.